and welcome to Perspectives. I'm your host, Roderick Williamson. Thank you very much, thank you very much. It happens almost on a daily basis. You open up your newspaper and on the headlines it says, 17-year-old arrested for armed robbery. Man get killed by spray of bullets. Now I know it's easy to read the headlines, to read the articles, shake your head in disappointment and disgust, and go on your merry way. But that doesn't solve the problem. We've gathered here today because we care about our neighborhood and our community. And we believe that we can give some beneficial ideas and solutions to transform our youth. Let's welcome our panel of guests on today. <laughs> to my far right, we have Ms. June O'Neill from the Mentors Project. Let's give her a big round of applause. And then we have Macon Police Deputy Chief Henderson Carswell. <laughs> Bibb County Coroner Leon Jones. <laughs> to my left, we have Bibb County Commissioner Joe Allen. <laughs> Deputy Sheriff David Davis. <laughs> and Dr. Edward Judy from the Board of Education. Let's give all our guests a big round of applause. Now, in, in the past couple of weeks, we've had several incidents of youth violence in Macon, stemming back to the shooting of the West Side students at the bus stop, to the shootings at the, uh, the, the party off of Eisenhower Parkway, and just last Thursday, we had a shooting off of L Street. So what I want to start with is to get some dialogue on what is the cause of all this violence? What do you think? And we can, anybody can, can go ahead and answer. We just want to throw out some causes of it. June? I think that young people are desperate, they're hopeless, we have a high dropout rate, and they're hanging out with nothing positive to do. And the key is to keep them in school and keep them positively influenced by people who care about them. Okay. Corner? The number one problem is the black man is not in the home. And he has not been in the home for a little while, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing the consequences of him not being in the home. And so it, there's no leadership in the home. And that's one of the reasons I think in, in speaking to kids, we have to start in the grammar school mm -hmm. because these kids, they don't have a father. As we speak now, it is 886 inmates in the Bibb County Jail. 659 are black, 583 are black male. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Yes, it's more yes. sad than ridiculous. Right. We have to hit the kids when they're like this. Right. When they're like this, it's too late. And the number one culprit with the black man not being in the home is Facebook, social networking. It's designed for one thing, but it's being used for another. Well, let me piggyback on that, because there was a study done by the National Campaign to Stop Violence out of Washington, DC. And they asked children what were the top reasons that they felt that kids participate in violent um, acts. The number one reason was the media. Do you believe that? No. You don't believe that? No. Any comments on that? No. I don't. The audience, I don't know, some of the people in the audience believe. Do you believe that? Yeah. That media plays a big role in violence. Anybody want to comment on that? In what type of, in what type of media are we talking here? The, the news, the type of shows that they see on the TV, the type of uh, video games that right. they're watching, the types of movies that they're exposed to. I think that, that plays a part. It desensitizes them to types of violence, the, the violent video games, the violent movies somewhat desensitizes them to it so that when they do get a gun and they shoot it, it's different from shooting it on a video game and, and seeing what happens in that and then shooting it in real life and realizing that somebody may die. Right, interesting. So in the event that that's occurring, I know a lot of the movies out there, a lot of the, the sitcoms out there, they kind of uh, glorify violence. How can the parent themselves um, get a handle on that? by controlling what goes on in that house. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a leader in that house, it's dysfunctional, okay? You have to control on what's going on in your house. Mm -hmm. You have to pay attention to your children when they're on the computer, mm -hmm. okay? They should have X amount of minutes on the computer. You have to know what's going on in your house. If you're in your house and you walk in a room and all of a sudden your daughter or son hit delete or cut the screen off, and you know something fishy about something, that. that. Exactly. Now, Commissioner Allen, I watched an uh, episode of Fox Focus, and they interviewed you on there, and, um, and you mentioned that you think that the reason why youth are, are participating so, so much in violence is a parental, parental issue, that the parents are mainly at fault. Could you expound on that? Do you remember that episode of Fox Focus? Yeah, I sticks by it. I mean, 
the parents are not at home. Like he said, the fathers have gone. Mm -hmm. it, whether it be white or black or Hispanic or whatever, most of the uh, fathers have left in these, a lot of these instances, leave the mother having to work. Mm -hmm. These kids have no parental guidance. Their parental guidance is the head of the gangs. Mm -hmm. And they, when they bring them in, they bring them in, I love you, brother. I am your person who's going to take care of you. Right. I'm watching your back. The mother can't watch the back. So the gang themselves have become their family. So I believe the parental uh, parents, whoever's there, the grandparent, the mother, we've got to find a way to get to these kids where they only have one parent in the home and find someone that can help with that parent. All right. So, so are we in agreement that because the students are getting the nurturing that they need in the home, that they're going to find it somewhere else? Can we say yes? Uh, yes. Can we all can. agree on that? And parents can't be the best friends. Right. That mom, that grandmother, that aunt, Second. they've got to be the parent. They've got to be the person that sets the limits, not the best friend. Right. There was an interview on uh, 13 WMAZ uh, with Pastor Maurice Watson of the Beulah Land Bible Church, and I think it was Pastor Ronald Terry, and they talked about um, the father not being in the home. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Watson specifically said that what we're seeing today is the result of 40 to 50 years of homes not having the father present. So how can we go back and fix that situation if, if it is fixable at all? Well, we first got to teach these young people how to deal with conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll find in most of these cases that result in gun violence, it's something that's been going on a month, two months, they're communicating on Facebook, they're threatening with one another, and ultimately it leads to somebody uh, getting shot before it's settled. Right. So would you say that I'm going to go ahead and pick on Facebook now. Is Facebook a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Audience, what you think? It's a thumbs down. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Why? Why would it be a thumbs what? down? I, when, I mean, I don't understand that because it's parental guidance. It's also the parents have a way to fix that computer to where, I mean, it, I use the computer. My kids use the computer. And, and I don't see them doing certain things right. on it because I can go back on that computer and I can find out where they've been. That's right. I can look and find out where they've been. Right. Don't think I hadn't done that. I have. And I think it's important because uh, parents, the more you're involved in your, ch ch your child's lives, the less likely the child is going to go out and find that parental uh, role model uh, out in the street somewhere. Um, I think Facebook, Twitter, they're all great social media tools, but just like anything that's good, it can always be a bad part of it. And I think uh, sometimes it can be used in a bad way, but I don't necessarily say we can make a general statement and say it's a bad thing. Yeah. I, I believe, first of all, you've got to have the literacy level right. to even occupy right. and, 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 and run with those systems. Of course. And, and what we have is a vicious social cycle here. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you an example. Georgia has a permanent expulsion law mm -hmm. for a kid, kids as young as kindergarten have been expelled. And so these kids are now permanently throughout the United States cannot attend school anywhere by law. Who would create such a law that would keep kids and create a lower social status? Mm -hmm. So now we have, we have a literacy problem. Right, right. And these same families grow up with parents that are illiterate. Mm -hmm. And you have whole communities where I have looked at and disaggregated data that said 54% of the people cannot read and write. Mm -hmm. So you're creating a social class that is hopeless and can't get a job if they even try to. Right. Now, I'm not going to deal with the social ills because I'm not a social psychologist, but I am an educator. Mm -hmm. And I have a responsibility inside the school system to educate our children, mm -hmm. all children. And as what Dr. Delamont, the superintendent, is, we're starting from the pre-K level mm -hmm. through 12 and post-education to target our children at the most earliest age because there's something missing fabric-wise, mm -hmm. character, morals, mm -hmm. integrity, those watchwords that have almost disappeared in our community. Right. So we have a responsibility to integrate those things within our school system. Someone has to stand up and take responsibility. Mm -hmm. And we, I'm not saying that, I came from a single parent mm -hmm. household. I did Grew as well. up in the projects. But my parents taught me something that one parent said learn. Mm -hmm. And over time, because of the resiliency some of us have, we're able to make it through the system. But there is no excuses right. for not assisting our children to help them through the system so we can curb some of this crime. And we're going to touch on a couple of those points that you made in just a second. Um, but let's move from the media as a cause of youth violence to 
poverty. Now, I know a lot of people say, I act the way I act because I live in the projects. I don't know if that term is politically correct nowadays, but I grew up in public housing. Um, and I think you choose to either stay where you are or you choose to do better. So is that a valid excuse? I don't think it's a valid excuse to say, this is all I know, so this is what I'm going to do. No, sir, it's not a valid Right, exactly. Any comments on that? Yeah, I, I, I want to make one right quick. Leon and I grew up next door to one another. I mean, his children growing up. Tyndall Heights is one of the projects, you want to call mm -hmm. it, right over the railroad tracks from where we are. We played at Tyndall Heights, mm -hmm. and I mean, mm -hmm. we didn't have any problems mm -hmm. up there. We could go and come. And I'm talking about white and black, go up there. We had, had a good time up there. I think it's the way things are, are rolling now in the future and the way things are happening with, with people. I think a lot of it's inside. And mm -hmm. we'll go back again to parenting. Mm -hmm. It all centers back to parenting in my book. Furnished 123 is a new way to shop and buy furniture. Did you know that for only $3.99, you can get a sofa, dining set, or bedroom set? Reclining sofas are only $5.99, and sectionals just $7.99. Any pair of lamps, a 5x7 rug, or accessory pack for $99. A three-piece table set for only $1.99. Queen mattress sets for only $2.99. It's that simple. Furnish 123. Furniture buying as easy as 123. Now open inside Mobley Furniture Outlet, Perry. We know a lot of people who grew up in single parent households uh, throughout history and, 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 and examples here. But I think we've had a disintegration of the neighborhood infrastructure mm -hmm. to where that uh, you have kids who don't even know who the next door neighbor is, but they can get on Facebook and be friends with people all across town, of course. know people all across the, the, the nation and, and can get on the internet and know people all over. <laughs> But the, the people who can really, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, in, uh, affect their lives, they don't even know who they are. The interaction, that is broken down. Uh, we see that in law enforcement. The people, you have a, a, a burglary or you have a crime and you go and check the neighborhood area and canvas the neighborhood, nobody knows who their neighbor is. Nobody begins the interaction to build that relationship to where that if one kid is doing wrong, they can call the mom and say, hey, I saw Johnny out uh, doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. That sort of thing and is- to discipline is, them if, if need be. That's right, and discipline, or at least tell the parents. Mm -hmm. But now you have neighborhoods where they see Johnny doing wrong, they're like, man, I'm just glad he's not doing wrong in my house. Right. He's not, they won't you know, pick up the phone and call somebody. So that's, that sort of goes hand in hand with, uh, with the family structure uh, falling apart, but the, the neighborhood fabric is beginning to uh, to disintegrate and there's, there's some problems there. I want to ask you a question, David. You know, we talked about poverty. We just mentioned poverty. How many families are, do we know? I mean, because with Kids You Love, I go through a lot of families through the year, and I know June, you do too. Poverty level families don't have computers. They ask for them, but we can't give them to computers. And yet, then they have to get hooked up to the internet. So actually, the poverty children that we're talking about right now, do we have a, uh, a number of how many of those that have computers? Because to me, if you got a computer and you hooked up, you're not a poverty level child. I mean, I, I wouldn't know that the, as far as the statistics on that, but I'm sure there are a great number who don't have computers, but there are a great number that do, and that does interact. And, 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 and uh, Chief Croswell can say, you know, that has been the basis of some of the conflicts. You know, somebody says something about Facebook, but before it was Facebook, it was neighborhood conflicts. Somebody said something about somebody else that the word got around. So Facebook is just a quicker way to get the word out. I don't think inherently it's bad or good. It's just a tool to get the word out as far as the statistics on who has uh, computers and, and lot. But there are a lot of people who, who don't have them. You're right. And, right. and, and still are uh, they're able to uh, rise above it or either get in trouble. If I can just interject something, it, the, you know, I'm new to this community in Macon here about 95 days. And, you know, the Maasai tribe, a fierce war tribe in Africa, they greet one another, the most fierce warriors, they pass each other and they ask the, a simple question. How are the children? That's who it's about. The children are your future. So if you're, if, can you honestly walk in your community today and say, how are all the children? Not some who live in certain neighborhoods. How are the children? And if you can't answer that question, that means that there's something wrong in our community. 
And those are important things for us to do. We know what the social ills out there. We know what the data is. I can tell you how many suspensions. There's over a thousand kids that are homeless in our community right now. I could tell you how many people are in our state prison system, how many of them have one or more parents inside of these old institutions, and what that does to them mentally. But we have to ask the fundamental question. We are the community. We have to wrap our rounds and say, how are we going to change our community and get our kids healthy again so that they can even do something productive in our community other than trying to run down the street and shoot each other over property they don't even own? That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. The term project came out many years ago, and that's exactly what it was, a project, a temporary living condition. We have now flowered that word by saying a housing, yeah, a housing, where generations of people come with that are hopeless. And a hopeless people don't have an opportunity. They don't see anything. That's why it's easy for them to take each other and shoot each other. And we have a responsibility, because we know when you know better, you do better. Exactly. And that's what our responsibility is. If we, have, if we have 84 children at the Mentors Project on the waiting list, children that have raised their hand and say, I need help to stay in school, I'm sure that other mentoring organizations have waiting lists as well. And if a child raises their hand and asks for help and doesn't get it, that makes them feel like they're not worth anything anyway. And having a hard time finding, actually. Absolutely, we need men and women to stand up and mentor. We have children asking for help. Some children in the audience are on the waiting list, waiting for mentors. And if they feel like nobody cares about them, the street and the gangs are calling their names and they'll say, we'll be there for you when nobody else will be. And I hope people will take this as a call to action to stand up and step up for these children. Right. Well, let me ask a question. <clears throat> I'm still a young man, but when I was in school, I remember the days when if I did something incorrectly, Ms. Jones was going to go to her drawer and pull out her paddle. And she was going to light me up and then send a letter home and call home and tell my mother mm -hmm. and my mother was going to support Ms. Jones. Mm -hmm. So what has happened? There's been some type of disconnect somewhere because we don't do that anymore nowadays. How old are you? I'm a young man. <laughs> 37. <laughs> hey, hey. You're 37. 37. I'm 58, and times has changed. Right. There's no discipline. Miss Jones cannot hit you in the Bibb County School right. anymore. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, right. Miss Jones cannot hit you in the Bibb County School anymore. I agree. You got discipline at school, and you got discipline at home. Right. I don't know what has changed, what law has changed, but there's no discipline. No, what they call corporal punishment? Corporal punishment. We call right. it getting your butt whipped with a paddle when That's I was right. in school. That's right. Okay, there's no corporal punishment, and that is some of the problem. Now, on the flip side of that, there was a certain group of leaders in this community that taught football and stuff like that. Jesse Carter, that's one of them. Mm -hmm. If you was bad in school and the teacher called Jesse Carter, you didn't play football, okay? You know, they're not any more Jesse Carters anymore. And that's some of the problem. Well, I wanna, um, I know we talked about Facebook and some people frowned on Facebook, but I have a huge Facebook following and a, and a huge uh, following on Twitter. So I pose the question, I do, I do a question every day and one of the questions I asked just this week was, is poor parenting the blame for youth who participate in youth and gang-related violence? One responder said, I think, is that, I think it is that, and also the lack of interest, love, compassion, and direction that leads children to these areas. Another responder said, each child is unique, and while this is a viable area to place blame, a community lack of parenting is only one of the problems. The lack of role models in the community is a big problem as well. When success in the community is based on bling bling, grills and rims, a systematic change of mindsets must take place. Do you agree? I do. I think that most of our youth need to see that there is more to life than bling bling. Is it 20 inch rims? I'm not really privy to that. Is it 20 inch sprinters? Do they do sprinters anymore? Yeah, they do. They do <laughs> They need to see that there's more out there than that. Um, I am a part of the Mentors Project, so I'm in June's program. I'm actually on the board of directors, so I mentor young black males um, mm -hmm. who need mentoring, who don't have a, a father figure in the home. And I think we, do, we need more people who've been in their shoes mm -hmm. to tell them that you've been there, mm -hmm. but that's not where you have to stay. 
it still goes back to the man not being in the home. But if the man is not in the home, we have to find out a way to deal with that because we can't necessarily put a man in the home, mm -hmm. so we've got to find an option. And you deal with it by going into the grammar schools mm -hmm. and talking to these kids when they're like this. If the, man is, if the man is not in the home, you go into the grammar schools and talk to the kids when they're like that. So outreach. Outreach. Okay. So let, let's, let's, let's change channels just a little bit. We've talked about some of the problems, um, some of the causes that we've thought of youth violence. Now, I've been researching the mayor's anti-crime plan. So we're going to go through this letter by letter, and we're going to give our comments in, on it. And basically, the purpose of this particular forum is, is not to just idly talk about the issues, but we want some resolution. We can talk and beat a dead horse all day, mm -hmm. but if we talk about it and don't put things into action, nothing gets done. Right. So the purpose of us coming out here on a, month, on a Tuesday evening is to develop some solutions. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we as a panel, we as a community, can develop one or two things that we're going to work on to try to make our community better, because it is our community. Come on, say it with me. Our community. Our community. Our community. Our community. All right, it's our community. So the first point on the mayor's anti-crime agenda says that the Macon police will be asked to expand its youth intervention program and efforts like D.A.R.E. and the Police Athletic League. Has that been instituted as of yet? No, sir. Is there any reason as to, as to why we are not moving in that direction? Well, we met again on that issue uh, at uh, a council committee with public safety mm -hmm. on last evening, and it was uh, put off for two more weeks to uh, do some more work on it. Okay. Um, I think that back in May of this year, there was an operation. Um, I'm not sure if it was the police department or the sheriff's department did Operation Safe Neighborhood. Yes. back in May, which was really, really uh, beneficial, which yielded some real good results, and then it was reinstituted in September. Yes. Yes. Um, my question is, if a program like that is so successful, um, and I have the numbers of, of the, the, the weapons that were confiscated, the, the, the drugs that were confiscated, the, the cash that was confiscated, why can't that be something that we regularly do as opposed to doing it when, when something happens? Well, the cost would probably be a factor because we bring in extra manpower. Uh, we hold folks over uh, and, uh, four hours extra on their shifts, mm -hmm. and we pull in folks who would normally be also the cost would be one factor. We just simply don't have enough people to run that kind of a right. detail on a regular basis. It just wouldn't be feasible uh, financially. Uh, but uh, we did get result, good results both mm -hmm. times, and uh, they were driven at uh, targeted areas where uh, significant criminal events had occurred, violent events. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, and it happened earlier in the year, like you said, and then right. again in August, and we got the results that we were looking for. And can I just put a couple of numbers out? Sure, go ahead. We've heard so much about you know, all the violence from the young people in Macon, but uh, last year this time, uh, we had 59 people injured by gunfire in Macon. This year we have 21 so far this year. I mean, 31, I'm sorry, which is down 28. Last year this time, we had 17 people that were killed by violence in Macon. This year, we uh, only have 11 so far, so we're down six. One is too many, we know that. But, but with all the things that have been said, that fact has gone unnoticed by everybody, it seems, except the police department. And, uh, but we still feel that there's more we can do. We want nobody killer, nobody injured by gunfire. We know it's going to take more than the police department. We're calling on the faith-based community. I mean, there's a church in just about every corner, some kind of religious organization. Making us known for that. But uh, what are we doing? Are we just telling the Bible story? Are we teaching a concept that, that story or the values that's included? in that story to, to change behavior. I mean, we got people that are old enough to know better and they're simply not doing better. I mean, the most simplest thing as to how precious life is, you know, for a man to hold a grudge a month and then shoot someone in the back, that's a serious right. illness. Right. But I think one small segment of this community is called a serious problem for, and it, and it over, it, it kind of blocks out all the wonderful things that Macon has going for it. It's an issue that the police can't do alone and we're reaching out to the uh, faith-based community to the Board of Education, we're reaching out to our fellow law enforcement agencies, and anybody, parents especially, because they're gonna be crucial to this, but where there aren't parents, as has already been stated, we got to come together and let the village help raise the child. Because it takes a village to raise a child. Yes. And you know, something I heard, let's give them a applause for that. Something I just saw on the news this morning, I know that uh, Police Chief Mike Burns had requested, I think it was $300,000. Yes. Um, and I think to fund maybe six or seven more officers. Six positions. Six, yes, six positions. And that was not voted upon. It was put off for put two off more weeks. For yes. two more weeks um, because uh, 
I think counsel said there was no way to to follow or or to to measure the success of the program or something along yes. those lines. Um, if we are low on manpower, how difficult is it to add more people to the force? Is that is that a hard thing, you would think? Well. And I'm just asking questions. I'm just talking yeah. about what I'm talking about. The police department is low on people. Sheriff's office is low on people. When you start people off at $25,000 a year, you're not going to attract many applicants. You're not going to attract a good quality of applicants. Mm -hmm. But the, the people who are there, of which the police department and the sheriff's office and, and uh, Chief Carswell is right, we're seeing declines even in the county where our primary responsibility is. We're seeing declines in assaults. We're seeing declines in, in uh, it, uh, car break-ins, uh, homicides. All of those numbers are declining. So we're seeing some good so results. We're seeing some good results. Right. But, the, but the men and women who are out there on the street doing the jobs are, are professional and they work hard every day. Uh, our drug squad just finished a, a major operation, and, and these types of things, you see the, the, the news media come out, you see the news uh, that we put out, and certainly we want to put the information out that we're doing the work, but those types, uh, those types of, uh, of operations take a lot of background work. You have to gather your intelligence as to where the problem is, who's involved with the problem, then uh, manage your resources to, uh, uh, to uh, attack that problem. So it takes a little time. So when you see something uh, once, two, three, four times a year, why aren't we doing this every week? Well, you have to build your case. You have to work it, get your resources towards that so that uh, so you can make an effective uh, impact and, and, and make a difference. And, and everybody can do something. The people here in the audience took the time out tonight to come to this important event, this forum that we're having here. Uh, I challenge them to take three hours on the weekend to find a, uh, you know, find a recreation center, find a church, find a, a, the Mentors Project, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. There are countless good organizations doing great things. Law enforcement can open the door. We can arrest the people. Uh, when we find out about a crime, law enforcement in this area does a good job of finding who did it and bringing them to justice. But to back that, that case up and get the people involved of where we don't even have to ever get involved in it. That's what I'd like to see, get it to where we don't ever even have to get involved. And everybody can do something on their street, in their neighborhood, in their community. And if, if